thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you to the White Museum for hosting this exhibition. My name is Bev Tosh, and just so you'll recognize me, there, I thought I'd start it with this. The title is About Face, and it's meant to be a bit of a pun on the fact that I did portraits for years before the pandemic started. But I want to take you much further back on a personal journey that my husband and I made. Change, please. We lived in Southeast Asia in Singapore in the 1970s um, for about a year and a half in 1975 and 1976. And uh, so what we were trying to do, just as the pandemic was approaching, but we didn't see it coming, we were on a ship bound from England for Singapore all those years later, going back to where we had lived. I'll show you a couple of photographs of Singapore from our time there. So these are photographs from that time that I took when we were young and just starting out with a young family. And it was a very, very formative time for me. I learned Chinese brush painting when I lived there. We had two small sons who started kindergarten there. Next slide, please. Uh, this was our house, the one on the left in Singapore, my husband and the boys, one of whom is uh, here tonight, um, and myself at Singapore's zoo in 1975. So it was a journey, because it was a formative time in our early life, it was really important. We'd never been back in all these years since. And so we took, um, we took a ship from England through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, um, past uh, India, Colombo, and into the Far East. Our destination was Singapore. The date we were to arrive was February the 13th, 2020. Um, when the ship left Southampton in early January, we hadn't even heard about a virus. When it was approaching Singapore, we were not permitted to land because the virus had already crept into Singapore. If you disembarked on the last place you could, which was Malaysia, next slide please, you were not allowed back on the ship regardless. So we chose to stay on the ship. That's as close as we got to Singapore just as the pandemic was starting to really bite into the world and the various locations throughout the globe. Next slide, please. Um, so this is as close, we're about five or 10 miles off. Our house that you saw in the slide, an earlier slide is still there. It was, we were going to spend four nights in Singapore, retrace some of our early memories and uh, places that were still there. And then we were flying home. Our tickets were coming from Singapore. Uh, that plan changed, the ship never stopped. We weren't sure exactly where it was going, but they announced fairly quickly that we were heading uh, to Perth, Australia, Western Australia. So anyone with enough meds who needed meds aboard and could stay those five extra days stayed on board, which was almost everybody. Um, then we found ourselves um, in Perth, Australia, and um, we had it one day there, scrambled to get air tickets from there, flew from Perth to Brisbane, a huge international airport. Next slide, please. And this is when we knew the world had changed. So as most people gradually in those five or six weeks came into the news being on the radio every night, watching TV, however, talking to others, we were not getting that. Our big shock was coming into this airport. So uh, this is us in the airport. And next slide, please. This is the, coming into the customs and security. There was no one in there, not one person before us. Next slide, please. Baggage carousels were no problem. There was one person who wasn't uh, a worker there. We were actually, before we went on to Canada, we were not sure, we were hungry by then, we were not sure if we should eat. There were two sort of little 
airport kiosks available, and we actually wondered if we might get food poisoning if we ate, because there was no one else there. Um, it worked out fine, and we had a lot of choice of seats on the way to Vancouver. So we're arriving back, I suppose a bit in shock at this point. Next slide, please. Um, and so the first thing I did, we had to mask. So I thought, well, I may as well have some fun with this. I'd been working with uh, war brides who were women who married foreign servicemen like my mother during w World War II and had to relocate to a different country to continue their life after the war. One of the slogans I heard so often from Britain was keep calm and carry on through the war years. That was the motto of the British people and probably further than that. So I kind of butchered a bra, um, <laughs> thought, well, I've got a ready-made face mask here. Uh, my family didn't really, and then I kind of um, stenciled it on. I used materials at hand if I didn't have them. I wasn't going to stores, like it was home. We came, flew in, that was it, we were home. So. Um, I thought it was funny. I, th I thought, you know, I have to have some humor. The streets are empty. We can walk, but we're not doing much of anything else in the very early start of the pandemic. Family didn't like walking with me very much <laughs> when I wore it, but anyway, that's another story. Next slide, please. Our, my studio is part of a large studio cooperative, um, fairly large. It's the oldest running studio cooperative in Canada. It's called, in Calgary, it's called the Burns Visual Arts Society. We have narrow hallways. I have a small north, face, north light facing studio. And um, for six weeks, we were closed down. We have narrow hallways. We have our own spaces, but a lot of shared facilities. We did not know at this point how the virus was spreading, exactly how. So um, it was closed for six weeks when it reopened. I went to an art supply store when they were open and bought exactly one thing during at least the first year and a half of the pandemic, one thing. I bought India ink. It happened to come with an eyedropper. And so I'd already had some paper that was gessoed and I would go in each day and I couldn't begin to continue the work I'd left when I left on that journey because life had changed so much in that Interim, not only, I don't mean the voyage, I mean the shock of coming back, the sudden change. You didn't see cars on the roads. You didn't really see people even walking very much. And uh, I took down all the curtains I could, let in as much light as I could, um, and started a new way of life. I baked a lot, but I'll come to that. But this is a blind contour, and a blind contour, I did it with an ink dropper that was the lid of the India ink. And so you didn't know when you'd run out of ink, but blind contour is when you never, never look at your surface. And to do a true one, you have to just look very carefully, almost lose yourself. It's a Zen-like almost state where you're, you're taking a kind of journey as though you're an ant and you're just losing yourself in the contours. Um, so this was the first one. Next slide, please. But because I was wearing, I'd only come in the, in the morning. Um, no one else was there. If I came in around nine in the morning, I was guaranteed to have the whole studio building to myself till at least noon. Um, and I just didn't know what to do. I was, as an artist, as a human being, how do you move through that? But I have my mask on. And so I started to do blind contours, looking at my eyes staring into my eyes with a mask on, never having any idea when I'd run out of ink. Sometimes I made my, all my own masks at that time and others for the family. And some of them had patterns on and I thought I was drawing the pattern, but they'd run out of ink. So it was, so it was really, it was more um, something I needed to do to move forward, but I didn't recognize it as, as that at the time. And how I'm very, my background's uh, psychology and fine art, and I'm very interested in how people interact. And suddenly, we've lost so much of our normal cues. You don't see the subtleties of a smile, or you don't 
see those things. And suddenly, it's just this part. And I remember I was in a, it was a medical clinic, and someone came to me, another patient wearing a mask, and she said, Helen? I said, no. You know, we're not even talking very much. But so it's, it's kind of a pouring, looking into the eyes more than anything. Next slide, please. And they sort of grew. I, I, that's what I did. I also had taken the underwire out of the bra because it's not very comfortable wearing a, it's not very effective wearing a mask that you can't sort of snug in there. Anyway, um, and we're walking a lot, my husband and I, and we live right near North Glenmore Park. So a kind of mental and physical um, of great importance was walking every day for at least an hour. So we'd be on our own, on our own paths. Next slide, please. And during that time, we're watching nature. It feels like I feel more centered than I have uh, up to that time. This little piece of wire, one of us nearly tripped over. And so this, is, this little piece of wire here is just a found piece of wire, rusted wire. Um, it was laying on the path and I, I, you know, in the trees and that. And I think I picked it up and tossed it a bit off the path so other people wouldn't trip on it. And then I picked it up and looked at it. It looked like a little gift. It looked a lot like a duck. And so uh, I took it back to the studio and I thought, it's a duck, but the duck needs a nest. So the nest became the underwire from my bra. I mean, obviously, I wasn't working for any greater audience than to just please myself and try and move forward and wasn't sure how, honestly. Next slide. And more of these. This is one where I actually, some of the patterning did actually get into it. But the, the eyes never line up. They, usually, they don't because you can't see what you're doing. Anyway, we'll get past this next one, please. And as I said, I made masks for myself and my family. And uh, Joanne, you had this one. Um, and so I was only wearing homemade masks at this point. But it, my life became about masks suddenly. Next slide, please. The importance of wearing them for safety, um, because that seemed to be the best course at that time. Uh, later in the pandemic, I did start to wear the disposable ones, but I usually didn't dispose of them. Um, Eggshells were from my COVID baking, and I, I really I made buns, I made bread, I made cookies. Uh, I made a lot of sweets, because I like sweets. I was eating it too, um, but it didn't seem to affect me one way or another, but it made me feel better. In the meantime, I'd rinse out the eggshells and they were getting a greater pile. Next slide, please. And I just found them beautiful and fragile and obviously a metaphor for our times and how I was feeling and how others were undoubtedly feeling. Um, and we'd pass people in the park, I've never me even mentioned this before, and you'd hear a snippet of conversation. And I'd sometimes, write it down on just that snippet, totally out of context. And I made kind of a COVID poem of, I don't know how many lines that are snippets, like one part of one line, they don't go together. But it was this disjointed, fractured life that it felt like we were living then. This is before any kind of um, uh, uh, immunization vaccine was available to even give a choice. Um, Next slide, please. So it wasn't long before the eggshells, they weren't intended to get in my artwork, but you know, there they were. I don't know if I dropped the first one or what happened. This uh, figure, which I now call Aria, but it really was tiptoeing on eggshells. It's had different titles were quite literally put on the bottom of this. And I thought of it as a singing figure. And then I thought of it as a voice bubble because I used to feel that way when I was a little girl coming from New Zealand in uh, Saskatoon. And I'd never seen, I'd never seen my, the kind of bubble when you breathe out. I'd never seen that condensation there. And I was told by an uncle that, that he could see my accent in my frozen breath. And I thought I can't hear my accent, uh, but obviously he could, and obviously people could see my accent in my breath. I was nine, I should have known better. <laughs> but in my life, adults didn't joke, so it, it was real. Anyway, so I've always been fascinated a bit with breath. 
And so for a while, there was a voice bubble kind of thing there. And then I made it tartan, and it was wrong. Um, but the last, the last one, and this piece is in the exhibition. It's not in the exhibition, pardon me. Um, and these are meant to be the virus. They're like little daisy-like things. It could be singing, but it could be much more ominous than that. And um, so these were my explorations in the studio for me navigating through these times. Uh, next one, please. Oh, and a close-up of that. Um, I want to say, too, that I gen generally work from whatever my source is or no source. I don't know what I'm going to get at the end. I start and something um, it leads me in a direction that often surprises me. So these are oil paint on canvas. There's um, also graphite. I draw, I paint. Uh, obviously, eggshells get into it. I'm a mark maker, and I particularly like making marks from the shoulder. So the bigger the painting, I can engage my body this way. The smaller you're working from your elbow, and the finest of all, you're working from your wrist or your fingertips. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this was one, I, I had this surface. I was scrounging my studio for working surfaces because I was not going and buying anymore. So whether they were old paintings, whether they were work that I hadn't taken further and it felt like it needed to, I don't know. Um, but these were eggshells from previously, and uh, they were meant to be like a, an egg pot of the oriental type, again, I think, from the time living in Southeast Asia. So those influences, I think, do come in. Uh, it never went any further than this. That's the way it was. But um, I got a photo that I'd never seen of my sister and I, and it became the source for this piece on that small uh, wooden surface that I had the eggshells on. So this is black. Um, the eggshells, you can see the contour of the vessel there. Next slide, please. Uh, and this was a source. This is, I'm the taller girl, um, and my year and a half um, year old younger sister on the four shorts called there of New Plymouth, New Zealand. The sand is very, very black, almost like graphite. It's magnetic as well. And it's the stuff of my earliest memories. It's very, very hot in December, January. You can hardly walk on it, but we live near the beach and that's uh, you know, the time of very early memories and a very unusual picture of my sister and I actually together. So uh, next slide, please. And it really spoke to me, especially in the, in the pandemic. I received it during the pandemic. And I took p traces of people, their footprints, the bits of their conversations. You weren't near them. As a matter of fact, you were trying to stay as far away from them as you could be. But somehow there was still that need to either eavesdrop or see some passage other than our own at that time. So again, walking every day. Next one, please. This one, the background is just a photo I took of ice in the park in the winter. Um, but the painting, if you can see it, but I kind of like it like this. I've never seen it like this. I call it on thin ice. It came from no source. It just seemed like three figures together interacting with another one. They seem to have masks on, but it wasn't really intentional, but it probably was in there somewhere. It's all kind of oil stick, which is oil paint stick, um, drawn and worked and just till it felt like it was right. It didn't get the title till after it was done because I sort of thought of it as one person against three. Um, and then after I looked at it and I thought, I think it's all about on thin ice. But I think, again, it was telling me that it was kind of a metaphor for our times. I wasn't consciously thinking that when I did it. Um, it's over top of an old work of some sort. Next, please. Um, and I have old photo albums. They have been the source of a lot of my war bride work, so they're there anyway. And in looking through them, I got thinking, these people are too close together without being masked. These are tiny photos from the 1940s. But I mean, really, they needed to be masked. So I made those little masks. They're reversible. They're tiny. Um, and you can take them off, and you can put them back on. And they fit each person. Uh, this one 
every person back there, or almost everyone, has a teeny, and they are really teeny mask. I don't think I could do it now, but again, it's early in the pandemic, so I'm making these little masks for these old photo albums so that everyone will be safe. Well, of course I know it won't make them safe. It's just something I need to do to move forward and get on with my work. And if you can't, laugh at yourself sometimes or poke some fun at a time that was often very grim and dark and worrisome, then it felt like I could, it felt like my art was leading me. I don't know, I was playing. Next, please. Um, and these two were literally uh, a war by couple. She's a young woman in Nelson, BC, and her New Zealand pilot husband who happens to be training and he's just earned his wings before she leaves for New Zealand. So an exact sort of identical situation to my own mother. I made masks for them. Um, that's probably what started it. Next, please. And a couple I didn't make masks for yet, or didn't at the time, but it, this Hazel West and Russell West play into the next part of the talk. And Hazel's been quite important to me over the years. I like to stay in touch with these ladies. Hazel is now 98. Um, they're in there, they're very, my mother's no longer alive. Most of them are no longer with us. But the ones that I painted and came in contact with, if I can, I stay in contact with. So again, she's, she's a young British woman, wedding day, fallen in love with her handsome Canadian RCAF uh, pilot from Raymond, Alberta. She's, she's ballet on the stage uh, studying it in London. She comes to Raymond, Alberta. Um, next slide, please. But this is not about that. That was work that I was doing earlier. This is about a poem, and I'm not sure if I can read it to you from that, but perhaps I can. I'm going to move to the other side because it's easier for me. Can I go back here? Hazel sent me an email. And she, she was emailing, and so we stayed in touch and talked by the phone. No, I'll come back here. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, and she said she liked to write, and she liked drama and whatnot. And she wrote this poem, and she called it Viral Safari. And I'll, I'll read it to you as best I can. There are strange things done by those on the run to get masses of tissue in store. They strive to get issue in large rolls of tissue from grocers and markets galore. The first thing they do is they fight through the zoo, uh, is to get, to get to the grocer's front door, is to beat out their neighbors in getting great papers in stacks at least a mile high. There are strange things done on the bathroom run as they pile up great rolls on the floor and they sigh with relief as they sink on the seat that their tush will be clean evermore. <laughs> this was written by a 95-year-old woman, not on toilet paper. What I did is I printed it onto toilet paper because I loved it. My title for her, this is my own self-title, was Paper Chase. Hers was Viral Safari, but it was her poem. And the only one of the war brides I visited during the pandemic, next slide, please. Oops, that's not it. Um, so this is the way I present it for her. I want to take it to her. Um, she was very, excuse me, very, very isolated, and I wanted to make her smile. So I made sure I got an embossed one. I had to fit the text backward to the same width, and I wanted a font that looked like an old typewriter. I mean, this was not a, a fast process. Anyway, next slide, please. Um, Hazel West, okay, next one. So this is me visiting Hazel um, in Tabor, Alberta, and she lives alone. She turned 98 years old in, on September 4th. She wrote it when she was just turning 96. She's uh, Hazel with her portrait. She's a wonderful, feisty woman, very, very isolated because now she's in a, a senior's place and she doesn't see anybody or not enough. To, and I wanted to try and make it nicer for her or 
talk with her because she's so bright. And how many others are there and so isolated? But this is during the pandemic, this, this particular one. And the roll of toilet paper is hanging up on a shelf. Next slide, please. Um, I doodle all the time, all the time. Shopping lists, um, grocery lists. Uh, I could go to notes I've written from Hazel talking on the telephone, see doodles all over them. I don't think about it. None of it's conscious. I don't even know what I've got. The only reason these are here is I found them on notes that I hadn't thrown away. Uh, next, please. Um, and I also had a couple of organ keyboards, old ones that were in a barn attic um, that spoke to me. I have not a musical bone in my body. Uh, I'm the first to admit it. Not at all. But for some reason, I needed a couple of these keyboards. And there it sat in a garage, gathering more dust. There were bird droppings on it, or mouse droppings, or I don't know what from the barn attic. And during the early in the pan early middle pandemic, I whipped it off the garage wall. I took it to the studio. I cleaned them all off. I took them all apart, and I thought they're all little pieces of paper. They're each a little piece of paper. Next slide, please. Uh, and so I went back to my garbage throwout doodles, and I didn't use, use it. I only used it as a reference. Next, please. And it wasn't for these ones. I just put it in there. I started to kind of scratch by hand with whatever compass. It was a compass because I didn't have what I needed. Um, and I tried ink and paint and different things. I was just playing. And I, they were all individual. They're meant to be little teeny pieces of paper. I had no idea how they'd work. Um, but I kind of liked them. Um, next slide, please. I never intended to put them back together again. They were never to be back together. I noticed on the end of the keyboard, something had pitted the keys that went, that went along. And I really liked it. So then I got freckled ones. Um, so all the chance things that happen. Uh, I like drawing. I love mark making. So they're done. And when you're scratching, you don't know what you've got until you kind of ink them a little bit. They're just plastic, um, as I said, on the, that old keyboard. Next slide, please. And then one day, I don't know why, I put them back together. And I really liked it. But these two, and they were the only two by chance, were too close together. This was a full face. So I put a mask on. Um, again, that's a removable mask. I, I think it's removable. It should be, if I can get it off again. Um, but I really liked it. And it became, it's called Opus, but it's really about social distancing. The real title is Opus, uh, subtitle, In Uncommon Time. So a marching beats common time, I've been told. But I thought what we're living in is uncommon time. This pandemic is uncommon time. It's time out of any time I've ever heard or known about. And strangely, the war brides I talked to said it was very much like World War II. They said it wasn't so much, it wasn't the bombs were dropping, but the feeling, the feeling of not knowing, the feeling of never knowing about tomorrow, of how interacting. Um, they often said there were so many parallels they hadn't felt since the war years. Um, next slide, please. Just some details. Uh, it's a one-off piece that I kind of loved and just, you know, led by those earlier mass drawings, I think. Um, next, please. Uh, and I was given a couple of little, these are damaged ivory keys, old, old ones. This one is so old and stained that whoever played the piano, that key, was a smoker in those years. It's stained with nicotine. It won't come off. It's ivory. I also learned with ivory, you cannot go away. You don't want to go. The graining of the ivory won't let you. It's very, very hard. My little compass that I was scratching with, it wasn't doing very much. But this is the first one I've done. I often love the first piece I did. It's just teeny, little, wee, teeny thing. It seems sort of like a pensive self-portrait in some ways. But I think all my work in some ways, I think all artists are about what they're about. So there is a certain self-portrait aspect, I think. Next, please. Um, Christmas, that first Christmas of pandemic. Um, uh, homemade masks. Uh, thank goodness Bill has a sense of humor. Um, Emily, our younger granddaughter, colored his eyebrows green. And he, this was our Chris, electronic Christmas card. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, I call it Mascot Buttercup. It was over top of a, I, I like to work over old paintings. I sometimes turn, often turn them upside down and they give a chance things, but this was not a portrait, a face, because it was never a portrait. It had never really worked. It looked like it had a, like a feather head. I didn't know what it was. It was something I'd done years ago. And I, I didn't realize it, but I'd wear my mask in the studio without realizing it. I'd come in because we had to, to and, and I, I guess I was comfortable enough with it. I'd find myself painting in, in, in the mask. And I thought, oh, I, I think my hair is starting to look more like the hair that was on that. So what I did is I simply took a brush with a thick white paint on it and kind of chiseled a longer neck profile more like what I've got, slapped the mask in. Um, I, I, there was just something direct about it that I liked that was very much about, be, about me as a self-portrait but not meant to be too literal or intended. Um, it just seemed like it came together. It's in a really, a frame that shouldn't work with it in this exhibition. And I can point it out there, a very, very heavy gold frame. I loved it in there. The two should never have worked together, but they did. Um, however, this piece shouldn't have worked on its own when I slapped a mask on it, but with a few changes it seemed to. And it was of the paintings, the first one that really spoke to me um, during the pandemic as a painting. Next, please. And then I, eggshell, um, I had eggshells, you can see in the hands there. I decided Mona Lisa really needed to, I was thinking of icons and icons of our time and were they protected? You know, I've done little photo albums. Maybe I, it was time to uh, do. So I just opened my Janssen art history book that I've had since my student days at the art college, very, very old volume. Um, there's a Mona Lisa in it. I eyeballed it just roughly on top of uh, a background of eggshells because it seemed like a fragile time. And then I put a mask on her. And uh, I like the title, it's called Pandemona. Mm -hmm. But I thought, yes, she's on her own in the Louvre and no one's visiting her, but she needs to be further protected. <laughs> so, um, and then the background could be virus, it could be, I don't know, it could be the world, just, um, it could be a constellation. It didn't really matter, it just somehow needed she needed a bit more space, and that did it for me. Next, please. And the reality of our home life is that our grandchildren live right next door. So this is our dining room window facing their dining room window. And um, this is still fairly, fairly early. It's not toward the end of the pandemic. So... Uh, I'd given the girls one of these little figurative, you know, art students always have them. And I brought the one home from my studio. And, you know, there was a period of time we could not interact, at least six weeks. And so we'd just move. Uh, Emily would move the arms a certain way, and I'd move. And, and the, the, we wouldn't see each other usually in the window. I happened to get her there. But those two figures would mirror each other. And it was sort of like talking through the dining room window. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but in that time, and when I did see them, they were trying to teach me sign language. So they'd teach me like grandfather. And I became, plus I was very interested because I don't watch the news. I'm not a, someone who's up to date in current affairs the way most of the rest of the world is. But my life had changed that way too because I was glued to the news at every day, the numbers, the what was happening, it, all about the pandemic really. And I also became so fascinated with the signer that was often on behind. So I wasn't really listening to the words, although I was, but I was watching the gestures. Um, and I became aware, the girls taught me, I can't remember, there was a new sign in ASL, American Sign Language, and the sign was COVID. And that is the sign. So um, I learned that in 
the day-to-day -day life, looking through the dining room window and um, watching the news. So I think my life's really kind of encroaching on the studio, maybe the studio encroaching on my life. But this piece is also in the exhibition. Um, it's called Read My Lips. And for me, the title is very important as well. A piece isn't quite finished until it has the right words that need to be the last touch to that piece. Um, so these are small surfaces I happen to have in my studio. Often worked over top of other surfaces. Next, please. Um, and now I take it to, so none of these, often when I started, I didn't know what I was going to get. In this case, and we, we are winding up here, there were two sort of major projects. One led into the other project. I don't know if you can read this. I don't necessarily want to read it all. I typed it on that hanky in, 19, in about 19... 90, early 90s. It tells the story of an old, an old lady. She was an older lady who was one, she was in the first class I taught for the art college. It was a watercolor class and the class went into an extension. So there, it went really well. Uh, so there were 12 weeks of it. And after the class was done, I got along very well with her. Her name was Daisy Benbow. And uh, she said to me after the class, dear, would you like to come and have tea with an old lady? And so for years, Daisy and I, this way before the war brides, Daisy and I would have tea together. Daisy was born in uh, Calgary, as far as I know. She lived here all her life. She was single all her life, and she passed away um, during the time I knew her. But at one point when we were having tea, she told me a story, and it stayed with me. And the pandemic was the right time to um, move forward with it. And it had come to that point. But Daisy, I'll, I'll tell you the gist of it. Daisy said to me that in the 30s or probably the 40s, the war years, dressmakers' forms were very expensive. So they're the mannequins that uh, fitted dresses from the earlier years. Instead of trying them on yourself, you would buy a dressmaker's form. It stood on a kind of a pole and had a stand. And so as you're sewing, you can use a pattern for it, but you can fit it on the mannequin that you've made to have your basic measurements. And in those days, especially if a person didn't have as much money, it wasn't so much the ready-mades as making your own clothes. But she said she couldn't afford it. She was a young woman then. So she had a friend wrap her in brown paper tape. This is my brown paper tape from our time at the art college, my time as a student, and my time teaching that class a number of years later that Daisy was in. She said, you can still buy it now, I think. And you can still buy it now. Uh, I can still get it at the art college. It was gummed on one side. So it was gluey on one side, but you had to wet it. Um, but not the other side. So she had her friend, she pulled on an automobile washcloth. These, and I like the story so much, I typed it from her words right at the time. So I've always had that hanky, never, as I said, um, uh, move forward with it. Uh, she pulled it over her head and her, fr her friend wound her in this wet paper until she was wound up like a mummy. Um, and then they cut it down the front well, she had to let it dry. Then they cut it down the front, and she simply stepped out of it. She went on to tell me, and it's all there, that she lived in an apartment block, and the apartment block um, employed an engineer on staff. That was the way it was in those days, you know, for fixing things. But anyway, she asked him to help her, and he found a pipe, fitted it onto a wooden stand. She thought it was wooden and put it at the right height, and she had her dressmaker's form. She was really pleased with it. She used it for a long, long time, and she said she made a sheath dress, and I remember her telling me these words, and she said it was very fitted, and she said I had to fit it on over and over, and she said I was very proud of it. Um, and uh, she wore it quite a bit, and then she moved, and the moving men had a pencil, and they put a circle around the point of each breast. And she said to me, I had a very good shape in those days. <laughs> That's the way she said it. Uh, I didn't, well, I did put it on there, but I, not on the other. She said, I moved again and it disappeared. But that story about women and body and 
resourcefulness and resilience and using what you had stayed with me. So I asked, I decided I needed to live this story because isolation was, I don't know, I, I think it weighed on all of us. Anyway, I asked Cindy Giesbrick, my friend, Cindy's come today, um, if she would wrap me in brown paper tape. Next slide, please. Cindy very wisely, and against my judgment, said, Bev, we should do a trial run first. I said, oh, why? We could just wind me in brown paper tape. Anyway, I borrowed a mannequin from somebody who collects older things in um, one of the studios. And she said, oh, of course you can use it. So this was Joan Packham's mannequin. She was going to do something with it, but she said, it won't hurt it if you do. So Cindy set it all up on her balcony. We, couldn't, we weren't really going inside. We were both masked. It was the height of the pandemic. And so Cindy, we figured out, Cindy figured out how many layers do you need to make a shell? Like when is it paper and when is it a shell? Um, and do you need to add more glue to what's there? Well, we certainly both found out that a mannequin's not a bottle. You don't just wind it up. Next slide, please. And a human being's even less a bottle. Uh, so this is Cindy on her balcony. We're both masked. It was 91 degrees, six hours. I have it in my diary at that time. Wrapping me, we couldn't find automobile washcloth that I could put over my head. So I'm in undergarments and cheesecloth on her balcony. Um, and Cindy's very carefully winding me in brown paper tape. Next slide, please. Um, between the application and the drying, it took six hours. I couldn't sit down because I couldn't bend here. Um, I leaned on the railing. I thought it was going to pass out. I can't imagine what Cindy went through. Both masks, extreme heat. Thank goodness no neighbors came and wondered what we were doing. Um, but this is early, you know, and we found out we needed shorter lengths. You can't just do the wrap like a mummy right off the bat. Next, please. Um, and Cindy said, we're cutting you down the back. So this is cutting me down the back. I, I'm stepping down her stairs, still masked. And, uh, or maybe I'm supporting myself on the railing. I'm not sure. Next, please. And it was the process of this that was so important. The connection of one human being wrapping another human being in anything, or even touching with brown paper tape. It was just some need. I mean, it had to be this time. So the cheesecloth stayed because I kind of liked the cheesecloth. There's a reason I'm putting this all on. Uh, next slide, please. This is sitting in the chair. Hardest, one of the hardest things I've ever done. Cindy set me up to do it, to stitch this. Cindy gave me the, Cindy's the fiber specialist. I am not. This is all new for me. So I'm stitching it with um, a silk. It's like a twine-like, beautiful raw silk thread. Um, downstairs in the basement where it's cool after it's dry, but it's hard to get through that shell now. And doing it by eye from underneath and not catching the cheesecloth. Anyway, got it stitched up the back. Reminded me of sutures. And it also reminded me of the aging body um, and how we slump and how I was certainly slumping and slump and carry one shoulder higher than the other. It's all about so many subtleties of the body. And uh, next slide, please. And then the last thing, and I didn't like it on a stand, so it's suspended, was writing Daisy's story in cursive uh, around and around and around it. And to properly see it, you need to move around the form. And for me, this is a really important piece. It's not my words, it's her words. Um, it's going from a young body to an older body. It's a slump, as I'm saying. It's about frailty. Um, and it moves a wee bit. And I really, really like that. And Cindy was wonderful. She got it. I trusted her. We lived near each other so I could go over and uh, do this quite easily. But we did it all outside on her balcony because that was the safest place. Next, please. Uh, next was a, I'd done that, so it was a, Pinata. It was uh, ear protectors, 
and we whacked it. It was meant to be a coronavirus. It was mixed success, but I only had so many ear things, and I was not going to stores. So whatever, an old sponge that I butchered and those, and the whole family took wax at it as hard as they could, and it felt a bit better. Next, please. Um, and this leads me to the last piece. Uh, whenever we were walking, I would see this, it was like detritus. It was the mass. The, and I, they were everywhere. They were caught in fences and drainage sort of gutters. And um, some lost by accident. Other, you know, gone. They started to suggest gone with the wind. Some thrown the way it would be a cigarette butt or a coffee cup. And I thought it's the new uh, kind of, I guess, detritus of our era, of our time. You never would have seen these a decade ago, ever, at least not the way. Next, please. They were everywhere. They were in anthills. They, I put none of these here. These are just a fraction of the number I took because it's not all about this. But you name it, they were everywhere. Next slide, please. Um, I thought, so they reminded me of Gone with the Wind. And then Gone with the Wind reminded me of ball gowns, Scarlett O'Hara, and this other time. And I thought, oh. I want to wear these things. I, I, I want to do something. I want it to be a ball. And I want, to, I want it, and then the ball's over. Um, so next slide, please. So I said to Cindy again, Cindy, I'm going to use the mannequin, and I want to make a ball gown. So I designed this skirt. Every, the, the pieces there, every nose wire, almost every nose wire, except the ones that go up over the front, uh, the bodice part, but all the rest of the bodice, all the nose wires, almost all the ear elastics are on. Every single mask in there can be used. And there's 200 and I forget how many of them. Um, but first I had to figure out how to do the skirt. So I bought the masks. And I, they wouldn't go round because of the nose wire, so they had to go up and down. So I, and they're slippery and you can't iron them. If, they, if you iron them, they melt. Uh, if you steam them, they melt. Um, so you, you just have to work with what you've got. And I started to like by chance, that's not what I planned to do, but it led me as I started it. So it started out with just big sheets of, sewed strips of it, and then the skirt sort of came together. The bodice, or the top part, whole other ball game. Next, please. Um, so putting them together uh, by hand, and I found out that all those blue masks aren't the same. They're different colors, they're different sizes. They don't come to the same length. They, um, so it was sort of hit and miss. I was learning as I was going. It didn't always work. It buckled a bit some places. Next, please. But I did have a vision. I wanted to do it. And I got, this is the start of the bodice part. I wanted some expansion over the sort of breasts. I wanted to be able to breathe. I didn't think I needed a waistband. I talked to Cindy, and Cindy uh, was, she talked me and helped me through this whole thing. I used... I have a sewing machine that could take most of it, but not the heavy work. Cindy's machine could do the, the heavier work. So uh, I could do the front of the bodice, but I couldn't do the back of the bodice, because how do you fit that in and do it? Um, so Cindy helped me, and it became almost a ritual. And it was important to me, because it was, again, a connection. Um, next, please. And putting it together, and Cindy said to me, Bev, you need a waistband. And I said, can't we just go bodice to skirt? And she said, no, you really need the, plus I needed this space there anyway, but my, sh my machine wouldn't take the weight of all, it wouldn't take that depth of all of that. Um, so uh, Cindy helped by hand. Cindy told me what thread to use. Um, and uh, the fitting was very, very important. Next slide, please. So in the end, it came back to this. And um, the last, I, the last part, as I said, is the title. It's called For Single Use Only. Mm -hmm. I went back to the boxes that I got the masks out of, and I thought, I know the title's there somewhere. Um, and sure enough, on one, in small print, for single use only. So that's what it was. Next slide, please. And this is the first time I tried it on, 
at Cindy's house. This is not a setup photo. This is a cell phone photo that Cindy took. I'm pinned in the back. This is Cindy's little dog, Pebbles, alternately jumping up. And I was afraid to get caught in the, um, the elastics and shooing Pebbles away. This is a painting of David Pugh's in the back that Cindy has. This is her living room. This is an absolute one-off quick Bang on, couldn't have gotten better. I loved it from a sort of classical figure painting point of view. It was interior, exterior, it was figurative, landscape, it was everything. And I loved the dark light play. It was all by chance. It was none of it was set up. Next, please. I loved it so much that after we decided on the exhibition, I did a little one for myself. The little one is that one right there. This one was for myself. It was the exhibition I already knew about. I knew it wouldn't fit, but I had to do life size. I had to. I turned upside down an old piece on purpose, leaving the underpainting, not the underpainting, the under image coming through. I know how to make it opaque if I want to, for sure. Again, this is the shoulder movement, and I could remember what this felt like. I can remember exactly being in this position. I just went at it like it, I was fencing with a brush. Um, I had a step. It's, it was so big I had to use a step. And it was somehow done. I didn't play with it. It was just done. Um, but it was meant to be about the ephemeral nature of maybe the times, maybe what we're going through, maybe the pandemic. And for me, I called it masquerade when it was done I thought I was done uh, with this. And uh, I said to Anne, after I have one more, um, it's not very small, and sent her the picture. And Anne said, Anne Ewan, who curated the show, said, it's in, Bev. And I kind of went, really? She hasn't even seen the real image, just on a, a little thing. But it, for me, finished it. It was just, as I said, done loosely by eye. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and things like the closing. I was fortunate to have Canada Council support in this. It was good for me to articulate what I wanted to do. Uh, I hadn't even applied for so many years, decades, I think. Um, in articulating it, it gave me a clearer vision with this piece going forward. Um, and it, I, I didn't know how it would come out or even if it would come out. But I'm sort of playing with this in closing because every part of this is face masks, including the closure. So these are frogs, they're called in Southeast Asia and the Orient. Um, they're just tied together um, elastics from the ear. So all parts of this, the only thing is interfacing in the waistband. Every other part of it is masked. There's nothing else other than mask in it. And I like this because it's expandable a bit. You can breathe a bit in it. And um, lastly, I have two last slides. Uh, and this really does show Cindy's help. I am very much pinned in. This is the same day as the one downstairs in the living room. And she said, come, I want to, you know, so she could get back and front. Pebbles is standing right there. Um, this is my ball gown and I'm Cinderella. It happens to be Cinderella bl blue and because the face masks are, and it's like, we're going to this ball. We're getting through this uh, one way or another. We truly were wearing face masks the whole time. Um, and my thanks to you, Cindy. It couldn't have happened without. And last slide, because I always need to start it the way I finished it. Uh, this one's the very last one I did, very much for me. The first two marks, my bags are packed in so many ways. Um, the first two marks were these. <laughs> and my bags were packed. We were going on a trip. Um, that's a whole other story. Um, and this was the painting of that time. Uh, so I hope you've um, enjoyed, or if not enjoyed, um, taken something from this. This is as honestly as I can tell you through my journey as an artist and a human being through the pandemic at a time when we didn't know what was going to happen. And thank you very much.